I wish to thank Pavel Kohout and I give the word to Josef Skvorensky. <coughs> there are few social phenomena more embedded in the sentimentalism and its tear-jerking cliches which would at the same time be less researched by sociologists and psychologists uh, than the phenomenon of exile. To avoid misunderstanding by exile, I mean the leaving of the country of one's birth against one's will and for reasons other than economic betterment. The notorious American exiles in Paris would therefore not qualify. In our century, this form of migration has become increasingly a mass occurrence, and therefore the set state of affairs of exile psychology and sociology constitutes a staggering lacuna in our knowledge of the contemporary world. <coughs> Excuse me. Any philosophizing about literature in exile should consequently concentrate not on the usual question of what does the quote-unquote unnatural situation of exile do to the creative mind, but rather on the problem of to what extent has the creative individual been able to shed light on a human situation which he shares with hundreds of thousands, if not already millions, of fellow human beings not endowed with artistic creativity. A such approach to the subject represents a shift from the old-fashioned Ovidian lamenting to modern Conradian exploring, a shift from the ridiculous, for the exile slot is not anymore a rare exception, the ridiculous tense of a yammer blabbering about distant Rome, to the man or woman who accepts his destiny and investigates it as a situation in man. The latter attitude naturally does not mean a total blackout on memories and an equally total integration, an indistinguishable merging with the new environment, an absolute transformation of personality. Firstly, such a metamorphosis is hardly possible at all. And secondly, an individual thus trans transformed would abdicate his unique opportunity of seeing one human experience in the light of another kind of human experience, or, if I may borrow Shklovsky's good old term, to see a part of our world defamiliarized, to perceive it reflected in a mind free of local accustomed preconceptions and mechanical responses. Another human experience in the case of exiled writers who came out of the cold of the Marx-Leninist night in the East is, I am afraid, an experience of what may easily be the model of the impending future of the entire world. Therefore, it can help these writers to view with much greater clarity the perennial farce of man's inability to learn from anything but autopsia, personal experience. It can aid them in making an equally vain attempt to explain, to warn, or simply to bear an informed, not just an astonished testimony to the fall of the so far only civilization words its name in human history. The name of the great and in some specific aspects not adequately understood writer comes here to mind. That of Josef Kozeniowski, known to literature as Joseph Conrad. The title of his novelistic analysis of the so-called Russian soul, in my and not only my opinion, its best analysis, because written by a man of two, not just one experiences, and thus radically different from the great Russian analysts of the same type of humanity. The title then of his Russian novel, Under Western Eyes, is paradigmatic. The constant reminders throughout the book of things happening under Western eyes and yet unnoticed by and incomprehensible to the Western mind, the unforgettable scene of the two Swiss know-nothings drinking beer in their cradle to coffee in Western security on the shores of the Genève Lake, while the pathetic tragedy of Razumov unravels itself within their earshot, these insights and observations have, unfortunately, lost nothing of their relevance and validity to this very day.
and comrades other even less adequately understood political novel, The Heart of Darkness, with its hundreds of Western interpretations, some very interesting, none, however, penetrating to the very heart of the darkness of the story, stands in hindsight as a phenomenal prophecy. Take the unobserved significance of the choosing of a Russian for the hero of a novel set in 19th century Congo. Take the Russian's relationship to and its slavish adoration of the abhorrent Mr. Kurtz, who, and I quote, whom, uh, and I quote, you can't judge as you would an ordinary man. What else is this than a prophetic extrapolation from what Conrad knew so well, also from autopsia, about the Russians, their self-sacrificial idealism, but also their ignorant messianism, their Oblomovian cruelty. How blindly these, today the most relevant aspects of the sinister tale, have been ignored, or more probably not properly appreciated, not only by the Western college professors, but also, for instance, by Western artists, such as, as Mr. Coppola, who mechanically transferred crude plot fragments from a poetic analysis of the totalitarian attitudes of the East to a widescreen discrediting of a war in the terms of Camus' evaluation of modern man's dilemma, not quite unjust, if certainly cruel and probably best badly mismanaged, the tragic outcome of which brought about some of the most ruthless manifestations of the same attitudes in our own century. However, if I may be permitted to comment, aesthetics betrays a lack of understanding best and takes its revenge. The shuddering and meaningful scene of Marlowe seeing the human skulls through his glass on Mr. Court's fence is transmongrified in Mr. Coppola's opus into Hollywood-like horrors which look as if they had been lifted out of Trader Horn or from any of the obscure films that followed this prototype in the U.S. and in wartime Italy. But back to the exiled writer. I would like to coin a slogan for him. Not of it, but Conrad. And while our weepers are still with us, the literati who have been pouring out book after book of mostly poetry, but sometimes prose, on the theme of the incurable nostalgia for a fatherland from which the evil but unanalyzed powers of communism have driven us, writers begin to pop up who have parted with sentimentalism, who have looked at our emigre human situation, sine lacrime et ira, who have tried to explore the societies in which fate has planted us using the defamiliarizing power of our two experiences. I am not comparing the artistic potential of such writers to that of Conrad. He was a rare genius, but his attitudes clearly are present, if only as a promise. It has always been my conviction that the Kurtzian unmentionable horrors of Stalinism had not only their comic aspect, but also have done some good. To be sure, the doing of good was unintentional. That, however, does not mean that it should go unobserved and unused in fiction. And let me state without trying to document my assertion in detail, because that would be beyond the scope of this brief paper, that one of the good things Stalinism has done to some, perhaps many of us, is our exile. I'm not thinking of the obvious material gains. Who would have dreamt 11 years ago in Prague of owning a house or of seeing the white, wide world? I'm thinking of character and of spiritual growth of a transition from a superficial to a philosophical lifestyle, of a journey from snobbish pride to Christian humbleness. Jan Brabeck, in his neglected novel, Whatever Happened to Wenceslas, has a moving and symptomatic character, that of the narrator's father, a small manufacturer in Czechoslovakia, living on the marketplace with its day-to-day -day financial worries and exhausting responsibilities, a man who, sensing the communist danger, knows no better but to resort to shallow anti-communist and pro-democratic political slogans without having the time, the frame of mind, and even the access to sources that would enable him to get under the surface of appearances and arrive at a real understanding of these two contenders for the soul of modern man. This merely Pavlovian man is forced to flee the country and comes to the States. His social status is drastically reduced. All he feels is the hatred of a wounded animal. 
He throws himself feverishly into the futile activity of writing letters to the editor about communism. Some are printed, but there is no response. The man soon realizes the vanity of such endeavors. But then he discovers the libraries of the free West, the evening courses of its free universities. Working as a laborer, he begins to study at night. He dies prematurely, but not before he has become a thoughtful historian, armed with profound knowledge with which to back up his democratic creed. He has no time to use it in the just crusade against Soviet communism, but he dies a more human, humane man. This is what I mean by the unintentional benefits of the totalitarian destruction of people. Yes, they will kill them, but some, and perhaps many, die more human than they would have died otherwise. I hope, naturally, that nobody will interpret my example taken from Jan Drabek as an approval of the naive envy some Western writers have half earnestly voiced for the inspirational qualities of suffering under totalitarian dictatorships. All I am trying to suggest is that chances are that without having been exiled, we would have remained not only less well-traveled and less well-to-do, but also somewhat shallower, more ridiculously self-satisfied, and one, and one human experience shorter. Perhaps I can say somewhat less human. I'm trying to suggest also that this, rather than the epistola ex ponto, is one of the major subjects for the exiled writer. Since we hopefully have gained at least something of the wisdom I have tried to sketch out, we should be richer as writers, and this Conradian richness of our humaneness should project somehow into the works that we, with the help of God and grants, shall write. <laughs> Naturally, I can come, it can come about overnight. After all, Conrad himself had to spend a decade on board British ships as a common sailor, officer and eventually captain before he even started writing. Obviously, some of us are too old for that, but some are not. And there are already glimpses of these works of the future. The very gifted Jaroslav Vejvoda, Jaroslav Vejvoda's latest collection of stories, Ptáci, the birds, is one such rather mighty glimpse. Drabek's flawed but interesting report on the death of Rosenkavalier shows this potential. There is a young man in Chicago by the name of Jan Novak, uh, who, in the manner of Nelson Algren, writes unsentimental, very naturalistic stories about Czechs in today's Windy City that are exiled literature in the sense of a fruitful clash between two experiences. He also currently has a play in New York of Broadway. Jan Benes, Zeleno, Naharu, Green Up, although very uneven and in part superficial, has some deep and revealing sequences. Eva Limanova, who years ago published a book of short stories in Prague, has recently written tales that are of the kind I have in mind. And there are, there are a few others whose names are totally unknown as yet. These are the Conradian beginnings. Naturally, I do not know whether there will be also some Conradian endings. All I can do is hope. Thank you.